Ferdinand. So I guess we still have a few people coming in. I'll just give people a minute to settle in. Okay, so thank, welcome back from the coffee break and thank you for attending the session on the role of NRENS. We're going to hear about today three, I think, very great presentations on what is an NREN, what kind of things is it that NRENS can do, and what can they do in the future that is different from what they do today, what are new initiatives, how do we support our users, how do we build networks, and not the least, how do we build communities and how do we support communities of not just NREN people, NREN researchers, but also of, of our users, of our developers, and, and, uh, and the wider social community. So we have three talks, uh, on different aspects of that topic. The first talk is from Gunnar Bu. Gunnar is from Uninet, the Norwegian NREN. He's been there leading their Uninet at Campus project, looking at how an NREN supports campus networking. He's been at Uninet for more than for many years, and before that, he'd been 10 years in industry. Gunnar is currently leading also the GN3 campus best practice effort, and he's going to talk about that project today, about what NREN, what NREN can do to support the activities on campus and how we can interact with campus people better. Thank you, Lars, for that um, introduction. Uh, just a very small correction so I don't take the honor for something I'm not doing. I'm not in charge of the Jean Tree project. That's Vida Faltinson, uh, which would very much have liked to be here today. Um, but the, this is um, um, the um, 17th of May, and it's a bit special day. It's the Constitution Day in Norway. So back in Norway today, there's a lot of celebrations, and I would normally have worn um, a black suit and a tie, but since my wife is not here, I can get away with dressing a bit more casual. Um, I will uh, talk about the the role of um, or an NREN in the role, uh, what role the NREN can have in terms of the work on um, campuses, and um, we'll start by looking at. Um, um, some of the statements that uh, some NRENs have made um, about their role. I have extracted um, some of the mission statements or vision uh, from different NRENs. And if we're looking at um, Janet, they say that they are dedicated to the needs of education and research. Uh, we can move on to SurfNet and saying that they, they are working to improve education and research. Um, by yeah, different means uh, and providing things that are not offered um, by the market. And if we're looking at what we say at Uninet, um, we deliver network connections and services um, to the universities, um, research institutions, um, and handle other national ICTs uh, tasks uh, in the best interest of society, which is a uh, quite important value for um, Uninet. Uh, there is something else that have also popped up, um, especially in the last few years, and that's when we're talking about end-to-end. -end. Uh, we're talking about the performance end-to-end, -end, and also services that are end-to-end. -end. Um, and I'll touch upon that a bit later. So if we um, look then at um, the role of the NREN, I like to ask some very simple questions. Um, where do we find higher education um, today? And um, what is the national research and education network without uh, something to connect? You would just have a nice uh, fiber circuit. You need to, uh, some campuses um, in there to connect so that you get a picture more like this. This is uh, very often how um, and NREN is uh, perceived connecting different campuses. Uh, but we can go on with these questions and ask um, more about uh, what is a campus then without the end users and taking 
one step even further into the campuses. And that is more what uh, we have done in uh, Norway. Um, this present, what the work that we have done most lately is in uh, the context of Shant, but I'm trying to give you a bit of history uh, behind it before it actually became a project uh, in Shant. And um, um, the original goal in Norway back in 2006, um, where um, quite a few um, relating to how we could achieve these missions uh, that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, meeting the needs of the higher education, uh, improve education and research, um, and work to the best interest of the society. Um, we um, had some goals relating to this, and this is um, the, the, um, the text directly from that, where we uh, put an effort or emphasis on that we wanted a coordinated and conform or conform e-infrastructure across the campuses in Norway to support um, these various um, uh, things that are going on on campus, whether it's e-science or storage, uh, distributed teaching or person-to-person -person communication. <coughs> but all of this um, involve the campuses, and for some that spells trouble, for others that spells opportunities and new things that we can do. Um, but we wanted to involve the campuses in a more structured way than we had before, because we, of course we worked together with the universities and cooperated. Um, but this was a more dedicated effort. So the Giga campus um, ran from 2006 to 2009, and I will touch a bit later upon what happened after 2009. And uh, it was presented at the TNC uh, conference in 2006. And I'm not going into all the details of it, but just focusing on the most important aspects of it that we have um, taken into the Shant project. Um, if we look at the stakeholders in this, uh, we had uh, the government providing um, some initial funding for this initiative. Um, we had ourselves, the NREN, with a dedicated uh, project team. And we had the universities um, that we invited and also tempted. Now, temptation is something that in European history or culture perhaps is not always considered something uh, positive. Don't, you shouldn't lead people into temptation. But there can be some good things about temptations as well. And uh, that's what we uh, <coughs> tried to do, find things that the universities were interested in. And uh, some of these uh, essential elements in our work was to have workshops and working groups, um, and I'll go more into details uh, about how these working groups um, behave or what they are doing. Uh, we had what we called best practice documents, um, and we also uh, ad gave advice and support to the campuses with uh, practical issues. <coughs> So if we look, uh, yeah, and in all of this that we were doing, uh, we were doing coordination, uh, we provided knowledge, and we tried to do this with high quality uh, in all the different uh, parts of our work. Um, the working groups, the purpose of these working groups was to provide a place where people uh, working on campuses uh, and uh, where they could meet uh, people that had similar challenges that was focused um, on the campuses. Uh, they could come into these working groups, uh, present uh, their work, the, the problems, the challenges that they had, and discuss them and uh, hopefully find some solutions or discuss with other people that um, had already solved it. Uh, also, this was a good place to have technical updates that was very specifically focused uh, on the campuses and not, not general sales talk from, from the vendors. 
and it gave us a place where we could discuss these best practices, uh, which then again gave us input to best practice uh, documents that we were producing. So if we're looking a bit more on these uh, best practice uh, documents, um, <coughs> we um, had um, these facilitated in these working uh, groups, or we had separate meetings uh, uh, where we met to work specifically on these uh, documents. And it involved active uh, participation from uh, the NREN. So we, we had to kind of be a bit of driving force, at least in the beginning of this. And I'll tell you more about the lessons I learned from that, both in Norway and in our Shant project uh, later in the presentation. Uh, but one important um, aspect of these um, best practice documents was to have some kind of approval from the community, from the universities uh, in Norway. So we set up a way of having um, uh, a process, a procedure for these uh, best practice documents where we worked on these initial versions and we iterated that in the working groups and uh, when we had uh, a kind of rough consensus in these uh, working groups, we put them up for national approval. And uh, that stage is done by the IT directors at the universities in Norway that kind of formally say, yes, this is good enough. We think this is the best practice that we want to use. Of course, they had checked that with their technical people um, as well. Um, but um, this process also gives the people that are not directly participating in the work groups an opportunity to influence um, these best practice documents. Um, and another important aspect of this is that it also gives commitment uh, that they have been part of the approval process and saying, yes, this is what we think are the best practice and we would like to use them on our campuses. Um, another um, aspect of these best practice documents are that they have written some of them in such a way that we have also used them for as requirement specification for procurement processes in Norway. Uh, procurement have been a very pa important part of this as well, but I'm not covering that in this uh, presentation. There will be a separate talk on that actually on the General Assembly, I think. Um, and you can then ask why we're not using consultants to produce these best practice documents. Well, if all the universities were doing that by themselves, it would be very expensive. And you would also risk that you wouldn't get the people uh, around that are uh, familiar with the campuses. We rely a lot on the technical experts at the universities because there are very knowledgeable and skillful people available there. Um, so, a bit back to the stakeholders um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's the government and the universities and the NREN. And of course, uh, we might want to see this uh, drawn in a little different way where the NREN actually could dictate uh, what should be going on, but that's not the way it actually works, even though we could wish for this sometimes. Uh, the fact is, it's the government that sits with the funding, and they provide funding for the NREN, and for the, uni for the universities also provide funding for the NREN. So it's important to have a good relationship um, with these. Um, so what's in this uh, way of working for the government? Well, um, they have responsibility for the infrastructure and for uh, research and education as a whole. And by supporting this kind of initiative, um, they take this responsibility so, uh, seriously and they show that to um, the community. Um, and uh, we want also to make the government look good and that they can um, also claim part of um, the success in, in this work. Uh, for the university, um, we make their life a lot easier because they don't have to produce all these kind of best practice uh, documents um, themselves because it takes a bit of work to do it. Um, the universities also get recognition when they participate in these um, working groups with their specialists, which um, they like to be, um, well, to get acknowledged for. 
and they get access uh, to knowledge. Even if they have skillful people, there are always uh, more to learn from um, other skillful uh, people that are knowledgeable. And then uh, finally, for the NREN, uh, we add more value to our services by doing this, and we get happy customers. So it's a very good uh, situation for us. Um, if we then uh, look at, um, uh, if we, we broaden our view on this, this is what we did in Norway, and we started this in 2006. Um, so is there any more support for this way of working? Well, in 2008, uh, the earnest report on the campus issue uh, was published. And they have a lot of good recommendation in this uh, report, and you can find it on the Terena website. And uh, one of the recommendations that they gave was to strengthen um, and uh, the collaboration between the national research education networks and the organization and institutions. And they uh, said you could do this in different ways to improve the deployment of key services. Um, but also to coordinate uh, working groups. And they have a lot of similar recommendations that fits very well with the way that we were working. Um, and we didn't pay them to write this report, actually. We didn't even contribute to it. Um, but I think that this um, report is still very relevant for the NRENs uh, today. So even if it was issued in 2008, it's well worth uh, reading again. So, uh, then we go to Shant 3 and um, the role that we have had in that, or has in that today. Uh, this is a huge project and we are just a very, very small part, as you can see uh, down there on that little circuit. Uh, we are part of what's called the networking activities uh, with a campus uh, best practice project. And the participants in... Um, this activity is it's led by Norway uh, and Vida Faltinsen, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, Finland and Czechia and Serbia are participating uh, together. And if you look at the manias that we have, um, I hope that you will take a note of that when we are looking at the results later, because we have three and a half manias per year in total, which is actually less than one mania per NREN each year. Um, the focus is um, very much on network uh, challenges on campus. And if you um, remember back to the first talk today, um, the campus issue and the campus bottleneck was actually mentioned in that talk. So it's just giving more support that there should be focus on the campus part. Um, we're trying to address some of these uh, key challenges um, on the uh, campus, uh, and there are many different aspects of that, as you can see here. Uh, it's the physical infrastructure with um, power supply, electricity, um, fire protection in the server rooms, um, the networking itself with light parts. We have looked at uh, IPv6. We have written recommendation on how to configure the switches in the best way so that you make sure that when you roll out new services, the switches and routers on the campuses are prepared for new services according to the best practices. We work with wireless. Uh, we have uh, um, network monitoring activities um, security and real-time communication. And several of these top subjects are also covered in different talks um, at uh, this conference. Um, so we have uh, challenged both ourselves but also the NRENs participating in this um, activity uh, to be a facilitator for uh, the people working out on the campuses <coughs> at the universities to get uh, working groups up and running and uh, provide these uh, to work to uh, provide these best practice uh, documents. Um, if we then look at um, some of the results um, from um, our work, um, 
We have uh, working groups uh, up and running in all uh, in these countries, in Finland, in uh, Serbia, here in uh, the Czech Republic and Finland. Um, on average, there are uh, at the moment around three working groups in each of these countries. In Norway, we have a lot more, but that's because we have worked with this uh, a lot longer. So this just goes to show uh, that in, in, in the time frame that we've used, spent so far, it's possible to make this work. Um, we also have a lot of uh, best practice documents that have um, been produced, um, 25 um, so far, and uh, they are available on these uh, web addresses. And of course, these cover uh, the areas um, that uh, we have already. I have already mentioned uh, physical infrastructure. Um, actually, there's one more here. That's the audiovisual uh, that we have also worked with. Um, in the first part of this project, but we are not continuing uh, that part. <coughs> um, if, if we look then at the dissemination, because um, that's part of the reason why I'm standing here today, is to tell you people about the work that we have doing, and perhaps uh, you'll be so interested in this that you would like to um, uh, know more about it. Um, uh, we have arranged uh, European uh, workshops with campus focus in <coughs> the areas that you can uh, that you see here, um, and we have also written up quite a bit of presentations and papers that uh, we are presenting at this conference. We will be present at UNICE uh, conference, and also we have papers accepted at uh, IEEE. Um, and this um, poster you can find outside uh, if you want to just have a quick look um, on some of the work that we are doing. So let's uh, move on to uh, the lessons that we have learned so far. Um, community building takes uh, time. Um, that's um, just a fact, so you have to be prepared for that. Uh, but it's wise to establish an inner core of people that are contributing and participating in this, but allow other people also to, what we call, be hangarounds, participate and be part of this, because you never know when they will also show some initiative and contribute. Um, it can be challenging for the workgroup leader to enforce uh, progress, because uh, people are volunteering here, uh, but it's still possible. Uh, also, key experts, they are usually very busy because they are good at what they are doing and they don't have any time to write. Uh, uh, but it's very important to have them in the group and contribute to the discussions even if they don't write documents. Um, we also have learned um, that NRENs, uh, it's better if the NREN pick the topics that should be used initially. Uh, that's uh, for all of these countries. The lessons that we have learned here is not specific for Norway. That's uh, collected from all these uh, four different countries that have participated in this work. Um, we get better discussions if we draft some best practice uh, documents before uh, we have the meetings. Um, and it's an important point that we shouldn't write huge uh, textbooks on this. We should keep it simple because if it's the best practice documents are too big, people won't uh, bother reading them. Um, and we have also seen that these uh, working groups and workshops that we have arranged, they are very valuable for informal talks or for people building networks, so they get to know other people that are working um, with similar issues and can contact them directly. So further work in uh, Shant 3 is to, of course, to create more of these best practice documents. You can see a list here of some of them. Uh, we will continue to spread this happy news uh, around. Uh, could be that we could come and present in your country if you're interested, or meeting with your NREN to discuss in more detail how to, you can organize a campus program. Um, if we go back to Norway, finally, uh, our initial project was from 2000, run until 2009. 
uh, we did a customer survey at the end of that, and actually 90% of the universities in Norway wanted us to continue uh, the work that we have been doing. So uh, this campus work is now a permanent activity in Norway. But uh, we are taking this even further with a new initiative called um, eCampus, uh, where we work uh, with um, an initiative to um, um, support the research and education even more by working on even higher layers at campus, lecture recording, large-scale use of video conferencing and mobile solutions, and I'm sure you will hear more about this uh, in the future. So, um, finally, um, these are addresses where you can find more information. If you want to contact us on email, there is an email address there. And you can look out for more best practice documents coming along. Uh, and you can subscribe to this email list to actually get those um, announcements. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Gunnar. We have time for a few questions. Anyone? It's hard to see out there. Huh. Have more light now. Yeah, there's a question down there. Can we have a microphone? Hello, I'm Nicole Gregoire from Surfnet. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering where the end user is in this story. I mean, you said campus guy on uh, campus guys on university level. Uh, are there any uh, end users like researchers or uh, uh, teachers involved in your uh, working groups? Um, on the initial work that we have been doing on the campuses, we have not had uh, the researchers participating. It's been mainly the technical uh, staff in the IT departments that have participated. But in the new eCampus initiative, there we have lecturers and researchers and people uh, that you are referring to that are participating. Okay, interesting, thank you. Other questions? Yes, there's one more, just in front of the previous questioner. Uh, hi, Daniele Arena, uh, Caspur. I wanted to ask you, these are best practices for campuses. Uh, do you have anything about best practices for national research networks? Uh, good question. No, we have not. Uh, we have focused uh, on best practices for, for the campuses. Um, in, in this work, but of course some of this work that we have done is applicable in different areas than, than the campuses. Uh, companies and big organizations in Norway have also contacted us and used uh, these best practices uh, documents in, 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 in their areas. So it's not like they are uh, unique to the campus because you find campuses in other uh, contexts um, as well. Any more questions? No, it doesn't look like it. Well, I have a question because I was wondering, um, what is the reaction from the campus people to this stuff? I, I, I could see campus people saying, oh no, don't you come and run our network. We'll run the network ourselves. Thank you very much. We don't want the NREN to take over everything. So do, do you get any of that? Well, we try to be very sensitive to this because, of course, we, we are coming from we don't want to take control on their campuses. It's very much the universities that are responsible for this. Uh, but we have had managed to create a good spirit of cooperation, and they see, see the benefits of working together with us in this. So we're very careful not to kind of step on their toes on, on the campuses, but um, yeah, listen carefully to what they are saying. OK. Thank you very much, Gunnar. Thank you. So our next speaker is Martin Beck. Martin is the Deputy Director of UNITHI, um, which is the Danish Center for IT for Research and Education. Um, Martin has been involved in uh, internet since mid-80s, and yeah. I thought you also in designing and operating research and education networks. Um, Recently, we've been doing many things, but one of them is to look into how can NRENs share services, build services together, use one service from another NREN, and so forth. 
been a lot of effort in the Nordic area that Martin has been leading. He still has more about that today. So welcome, Martin. Thank you. Well, uh, this is about the services um, that are offered by an NREN. If you look at, at an NREN, usually we, we, we think of it as we have the network and then there's a number of services on top. Here we define that everything is a service, also the basic network, the basic internet provision, and so on. And if we look at all the services an NREN provides, we call it the service portfolio, and, and um, I've shown you some statistics up there, uh, which makes it fair to conclude that an average NREN has about 30 services. Now, if we look at those services and say, where do they come from? How does the NREN actually produce or procure the services? Of course, some of them are homemade, where we, the NRENs, buy the, ser uh, the servers and we uh, uh, put... Um, uh, we also maybe uh, even uh, write the software ourselves or we take it open source and, and so on, DNS, NTP, stuff like that. We build ourselves usually, okay? Some uh, services, on the other hand, is the direct opposite. There we buy a commercial product and we just resell it, repackage it, or maybe add uh, 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 authentic federated authentication uh, AI to it, and, and then we have a service. And then, of course, we also uh, have services as part of the NREN portfolio that are not produced our, as our, of our, by ourselves as an NREN, but uh, by our member institutions, by universities and so on. We say, oh, this is a very good service. We uh, uh, make that available and support it for the whole uh, of our constituency. Um, and, of course, uh, we are so fortunate to have the uh, regional organization, Nordjonet, uh, but, but many of you are in the same position uh, uh, where you have either regional organizations or your country is so big, like uh, uh, Spain or somewhere, where you actually have a lot of networks that are grouped together. So, so uh, maybe you get uh, your service from the regional uh, collaboration uh, organization or from Xi'an uh, uh, through all these uh, nice EU projects, and uh, possibly through a combination of these. Now, there's also another uh, last alternative, which, of course, I'm going to explore here, and that is we could also get it directly from another NREN. If they have uh, produced it, if they have made it, it will probably also fit our needs and it will probably be uh, better and, and more efficient than, than doing it together with a commercial partner of, uh, uh, all over again or uh, uh, making it ourselves. So um, it, it, it seems a good idea uh, because it, it's also a way to, to uh, complete the service portfolio and make available to our users what they have in other countries or other regions. Uh, so it makes sense altogether. In order to explore this, we have in, in, in uh, uh, we started in, in the, the Northern group of, of NRENs uh, in the so-called CTO forum to uh, look at this, and we find out, uh, found out that this was a, a good idea to explore, so we uh, uh, created the so-called Inter-NREN Service Provisioning Working Group. I mean, uh, what it's called is not really uh, that interesting. Only uh, all these documents are available online, uh, so if you actually want to find them, you, you, you'll need to, to know where to search, okay? Um, and what we did there was to, to uh, say, the, get together the people that really uh, uh, work with service provisioning, service portfolio management, and so on, and say, let's start by actually make a map of what we have, each of us. The so-called service map, and uh, we have some uh, uh, small symbols down there. Uh, the legend here saying how much is it federated. Maybe it's not uh, at all uh, in, in need of being federated because it's just public, uh, publicly available like DNS or whatever. And here we have the service map. And of course, you're not supposed to read it. Read it online, study it if you want to. It's just to show you uh, that uh, you may be aware that your own NREN has a gap in some place, or, or maybe you can compare what, how, how do the other NRENs produce a given service and so on. Uh, actually, it's, it's quite uh, interesting because you think 
you as an NREN together with your users, that you have invented everything there is, is to, to invent, but once you see the service map, you get much wiser. Okay? And what do we use the service map for, of course? Uh, yeah, I've just explained it. Uh, getting new ideas and, of course, getting ideas how to operate services jointly. Um, but once you start doing that, you run into a number of obstacles. And dealing with these obstacles is really what this work uh, I'm presenting here today is about. Um, the first, of all, uh, first obstacle of all, uh, naturally, is knowing what is out there. What services do they have? And I mean, that's the service map, okay? We've done that. Uh, then the next thing is you need to get the money. Uh, probably if the service is not completely free of charge, you need to pay some money to contribute to that service. And, and uh, doing that also presents some legal uh, um, obstacles. Uh, or challenges, you might say. Then <clears throat> you find out that maybe in another NREN they have a very nice service, but they have actually bought that under a contract which does not allow them to resell it to us. And if that's the case, then it's just too bad. Then, then uh, uh, they'll have to buy it under a new contract or we'll have to buy it ourselves. Uh, uh, in any way, uh, uh, you can't sell it on, and so there's no uh, um, possibility of collaboration there. And preparing your own services to be exported or shared uh, is really also a, a, a thing that, that needs attention. And then, of course, in order to log into uh, the services where that is relevant, you need the federated AAI, and that is almost in place, even on a pan-European level. And then, of course, the localization or translation enabling and the IPR clearing, if that's a, a case, is also uh, um, uh, things that need to be taken care of. So this is really the shopping list you need to do, well, you need to go through if you are preparing to export a service. I, I wouldn't say export, really to uh, get economy of scale by having more people contribute to the operation and to, to the establishment of that service. A few of these points I'll uh, explore in more depth here. Let's start by the um, model for, for payment or cost recovery, procurement, whatever you call it. Today we have a scheme, at least in the Nordic area, where we get a service, that's the red arrows up there, and for that we pay uh, to that uh, uh, regional community uh, uh, entity, Nordunet, and um, but but if we are going to to exchange uh, services between two networks uh, uh, in the Nordic area, then usually if it's over the threshold, then we'll have to go through a procurement process. That's the default value. The problem of a procurement process is that it is, of course, a burden for the. Uh, that party who is going to write uh, the call for tender and do the contracts and all that and evaluate bits and so on. Uh, and and um, you tend to think only of that. That is a burden in itself, but it's actually also a burden for the supplying NREN because they have to make a, 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 a complete offer and uh, enter into a contract that they, uh, a lot of administration that they, they wouldn't have uh, uh, had to do anyhow. Uh, in any other uh, case. One idea has been uh, to simply add it to the Nordunet service portfolio. So uh, the Nordunet gets a little service back and they, uh, they sell that on, you could say, to, to, um, to the other uh, entities. But it also has some legal problems and it's not always uh, possible actually to do that. So uh, that needs to be explored too. Um, we have recently, Nordunet did an, um, uh, had an, an expert legal opinion uh, on uh, a part of this matter where they said, uh, or wh where it was determined that in a case like Nordunet, where uh, it is uh, completely owned by the partners, you could think of it as a kind of joint venture, and um, uh, you don't need to, just as you don't need to make a call for tender if you are producing something yourself. Then, if you're producing something in common, you can you can always you can also regard it as 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 doing it yourself, and therefore you don't need to do a call for tender. Um, but of course, then if 
Nordunate, the clearing house here in, in this uh, uh, scheme, uh, still has to do a, a call for tender if they procure something from the outside. Um, yeah, the solution to all this, still, if you want to, to uh, be a part of a project which is already running, uh, the solution to this which has been proposed uh, uh, is to simply turn it into a community project where everyone is, is uh, equally, not equally, but in a fair proportion, uh, um, uh, contributing to that project. Because if they are contributing to the project, it's not something they buy from the outside, and then also uh, you can get around the, the um, obligation to call for tender. Um, I have a few illustrations of the matter here. I don't know whether words or, or, or figures make it more clear, so we try again with, with, with the illustrations here. Here we have a situation where we have a, no, a number of suppliers, and of course, uh, through a, a procurement process, we call for tender. Uh, four of them they get, get disappointed, while, while the uh, fifth here, uh, he gets to supply to the NREN, and then uh, it is for this to work, they should have uh, this uh, call for tender preparing or, or foreseeing that it is not only uh, bought by this NREN, but also exported or on behalf of the other entities that you want to export to. Um, so if you just have a homemade service here, you could say it's homemade, so he doesn't uh, need to call for tender uh, to, to, to use it uh, himself. Whereas if it's over the threshold, of course, you need to call for tender uh, uh, here at NREN2. And the, re the obvious uh, uh, way to go about it is to um, make it a kind of homemade service where you do it in common. This is also, uh, for instance, has been uh, the, the, the case with uh, the development efforts around the NSI, Network Service Interface, and uh, also File Center, a very nice project that has been... Uh, how many of you went to the buff yesterday? Yes, there was a few, but I can say for, for the rest of you, you missed a good thing there. Now... Um, <coughs> Um, yeah. Then if you look at the at, um, call for tender itself, you also need to prepare in the call for tender uh, uh, or be, yeah, uh, have it uh, foresee that, that you will actually um, contract, as it is saying here, on behalf of other contracting authorities. So uh, here is a, uh, an example where uh, Nordunet, uh, they made a nice contract with Juniper, and this contract says that, ooh, anyone in the Nordic region can buy onto this contract, and Juniper agrees to that, and that's fine. But in the original call for tender, they actually forgot to tick the box. Yes, here we are uh, uh, procuring on behalf of others, and, and I mean, uh, Nordunet, there we have talked about that, and they're... They fine with it, but I'm, I'm just taking it here as an example of something you should beware. Okay? Um, then there's also the problem of uh, commercial providers. For instance, if um, Sunnet in Sweden, they have a nice, very nice Adobe Connect service, but then when we call uh, 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 Adobe and say, hey, hey, Adobe, we want to have uh, the same prices, uh, as they do in Sweden, and the same uh, terms and conditions and so on, they say, okay, okay, you want that, uh, but then we need to make it one contract, okay? One contract for everyone. Fine, we say, very good. And then they say, ah, but then you're a service provider. Then you're not academia anymore because you're providing for several institutions. So that's quite another rate, and you can't get the good prices. Uh, and uh, so, so there's also an obstacle uh, in the way that a commercial uh, operators are, are, are actually uh, uh, pricing and uh, regionalizing uh, the, their sales force and so on. The third obstacle, I'm happy to say, is uh, almost removed. Uh, today we have uh, in, in a kind of federated uh, AAI in the Nordic region and uh, also that is the case in, on the pan-European level with Edugain. 
So that's a good thing. And we have started to uh, exchange services, uh, actually. Um, so there are some examples up here, and uh, there are more to come. Uh, we have planned, again, if you go to Nordunet Wiki, you can find uh, that we have great plans for a lot of, of, of uh, um, service exchange. So I think this is moving. And also moving on a European level in the TFMSP, uh, task force I'm participating in, uh, we uh, have uh, discussed this and wanted to more or less uh, do the same and see w w how far it can get us actually. Um, and again, the first prerequis prerequisite to do this is uh, to make the service map and uh, uh, we've started uh, little by little to do that. The best example is actually the service map of Red Iris, already put on, on, the, on the Terrena uh, uh, wiki there, the conference. Uh, and you can see it, it, you're not supposed to read it, okay? It's just to show you that they've done an, an impressive job actually documenting what they have and putting it in comparable boxes so that all of us can see what we are missing, okay? Believe you me, it's good. Um, <clears throat> and again, taking the Nordic module, uh, model uh, 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 to a European level, uh, we could have uh, Dandy uh, or Terena act as a clearinghouse for cost recovery, recovery and so on, but uh, uh, we are not there yet. Uh, from a legal point, I think this should be studied a little closer before we, we are ready to go. Um, and also, uh, in, in TFMSP, we have proposed to... to create a kind of set of best practices to document uh, what is needed in order to exchange services, and I think that will uh, probably be a, a work that will uh, commence uh, later this year, I hope, at least. Um, and also, yeah, uh, like we have the uh, uh, Nordic um, Kalmar Union uh, uh, Federated uh, AAI, it, it's also... Uh, there on a European level, and um, there are examples also on a European level of shared services, uh, cross-border fibers and so on are also a good example of shared services really, where you have to find a cost-sharing uh, cost model and so on. So it is little by little going, and I think if we could, could uh, uh, build this into the way that we build uh, service uh, our service portfolio, each of every service, uh, and, and think about this once we create it and make the contracts and so on, we could get a lot further. Um, the status today I've uh, illustrated by, by little progress bars here. Um, yeah. So that's how far we got, and I hope uh, in a year or two that we will have all the progress bars totally read. Thank you. So we have some time for questions. Any questions from the audience? Now that it's self-explanatory. It looks like there's a question over there. Yeah. We got a microphone. Uh, Alex Reid, Arnett in Australia. Um, shared services always sounds like a great idea because we're doing all the same things and so we can share it. And I know there's some brilliant examples. Um, but I, I also worry about the extra overhead of trying to ensure that the, the something that's being developed or being acquired meets the diverse needs of a variety of customers, different NRENs. Mm. Um, you know, how, do, how do you assess that? And have you, have you done any work to sort of evaluate... You know, how much extra effort is required because you're doing, you know, providing something for a range of customers. And uh, at what point does it become too top-heavy and the uh, extra effort is not worth it? And how, did, how do you decide that? Yeah, but, but providing a service for, for uh, or developing a service in, in, as a group or in common or providing a service for, uh, for someone else except for your, uh, outside your own constituency is always a small burden. But 
usually it's, it's worthwhile, uh, or it is worthwhile, if you then can grow your, the whole uh, service uh, because you get better economy uh, to do the development or uh, uh, things like that. So, so, so I, I think it's really a, a kind of a market sh uh, thing. If you um, do not do this unless it pays off for you to uh, share the service. And, and I think that will, will regulate it. And so some of the services are really similar uh, and, and uh, don't even need to be translated or anything, whereas other services, of course, are very specific uh, 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 for per constituency or per NREN, naturally. And there are also a lot of... of, of uh, um, a lot of... of um, uh, things limiting. I mean, you, in some cases, you, you get a grant or you, 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 you get uh, money, and there are a lot of conditions tied uh, in with that, so you can't share anything uh, uh, needs to be on the territory. There, there can be a lot of, of constraints there, uh, naturally, also. So it's not possible in every case. I, I'm not uh, advocating for, for everything. Uh, to be one shared service delivered by uh, 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 that that one service in a specific field will will fit all entrants, uh, not at all. But I think there are some low-hanging fruits that we don't harvest today. Thank you. There's one more question down here. Hi, Jan Meyer from Uninet. Hi. Um, one of few persons who actually have, has done this before a couple of times. Uh, so I have some practical experience with the problem space. This is, and, this is the file center guy. Uh, yeah, file center and the guy that brought you those nice server certificates against the flat rate. Um, the problem Alex points out is, yeah, you do get a certain amount of overhead. What I've experienced is you get overhead if you do all the things on your own as well. I'm a PKI specialist, I used to be. Uh, every NREN has a PKI specialist. Those people need to train, those people need to maintain their experience, their skills. That is overhead as well. So if you actually share the burden of developing a certain service, then you can specialize. And that also means that certain NRENs can choose to no longer have a very good PKI specialist because someone else takes care of the problem. There's also the cost of opportunity. The two projects that I'm so far most happy with, those were projects that I could never have achieved in my own NREN because we didn't have enough money. It was not there. But with eight NRENs, we did. And the result is fairly nice. So it's not so much a matter of there's only the overhead cost. No, there's the cost of lost opportunity if you don't do this. And of course, there's a balance to be found there. What I found is as long as there is one person who can actually keep track of everything that's going on and can keep proper control, proper project management, you're usually quite all right. As soon as you need to do design by committee, then you're probably not quite all right. Small not small. You can do them large, but you have, to make, you have to identify carefully where you put the collaborative effort. What I never ever would want to do in a project like that is take on the support burden for his community. That would be wrong. He has all those relationships, he knows those people, he speaks the language. I don't speak Danish, I speak Norwegian. So that's, that's something I would never want to do. But a certificate factory does not care whether it serves 300,000 people or 3 million people. That's called automation and that's what computers are good at. So you have to chop the problem space up in manageable pieces mm. and figure out exactly where does it make sense and where do I need to be as close as possible to the user? That would be different per service that you deliver. This also forces you as a service provider to productize properly, to package the product that you're selling more than when you would leave it to your own end At least I, I, I can back that, that up. We, this was never this was the intention of this was to share technical services, not to outsource uh, all, all the, uh, the support to India or, or uh, things like that. So, so it's, it's merely a technical thing. But building on that, isn't it also the case that this is much easier to do if the service was built with this in mind initially? Mm. I mean, 
it's harder to share a service that well, we didn't think about this than something like File Thunder that was originally built with the thought in mind that more than one NREN would run that kind of service. So it's exactly. something that we have to get in the habit of thinking about as NREN when we start building something new from the start, think about what would this look like if I did this also for my neighboring NREN, because that would then it's in yes. the shame much easier. It can also ensure the existence and development of a service if, if your own funding uh, temporarily goes away uh, for, for, for that service, uh, then it can still exist. Yes? Okay, more questions for Martin? Looks like that's not the case. Thank you very much, Martin. So, our final speaker for the session is Stefan Ribas. Stefan has uh, spent 12 years in industry, in building software, supporting large software projects, doing open source development. Since 2008, he's joined Andrea in France, where he's co-led several open source projects. He's talked to us today about how to build a successful open source community, how to get commitment and energy into such a community, and how to direct the evolution of the community. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. So uh, I'm coming from INRIA, which is a um, French public institute working on computers, robotics, reality, uh, virtual reality, but as well on dev systems. We are doing a lot of open source, and I'm very happy today to, to explain our methodologies that we, we, we give as best practices within our institute to our scientific. So I'm coming from development. So I'm not coming from your, your community, which is more uh, network infrastructure, to do it simple. simple. Uh, so uh, I don't use the same terms as you. When I will speak about network, it's a network of people. When I will speak about project, for you it could be a product, okay? So sorry if I use uh, some terms for you which are not the same, but I will try to, 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 to speak your language or your, your dictionary. So, uh, First of all, I would like to say that a lot of people spoke uh, since I arrived on Sunday evening about communities, but nobody gave a definition. And I suppose it's quite important to see that a community or a group of people who, for a specific topic, share one or more of the following. So, interest, speciality, roles, concerns, set of problems, and a passion. But what makes them work together? It's interacting on a continuum basis. I mean, they ask and answer questions. They share their knowledge. They, thanks to this sharing of knowledge, they could as well use ideas of others and so improve progress and again increase their competencies. And of course, more important, perhaps, they solve problems for others. But again, a lot of people shown methodologies yesterday, today, this morning, but they don't pay, they give you uh, some tricks or hints, but I think you should know the genesis. Why an open source community grows up? Why a community grows? Why it's, wha what is the birth? Why suddenly, puff, it blow up or it blossom? So it blossoms. <laughs> Very important. For me, the project answer a need. Then the scientific will publish the project, the open source project, the code to increase the development, the code development. And then it will take care that it's got a community where the network, where the people get benefits or get interest to participate. And everybody gets, it's a positive sum of people. We, I have an example, a French example, very famous. This is EZPAC, which is in fact sort of a um, setup program built by uh, one of our uh, friends, uh, Julien Ponge. Uh, is very famous in the Java community, it's quite huge, and he, he needed to, for his studies to, to, to build a program and to deploy it. He couldn't find for Java on the web a program that could uh, create his setup and deploy on several machines. So he had an issue, he, he, he had a need, and he could not find the software to do it. So he created the setup program for Java program for deployment, he answered his need, then he published it on the web to promote his existence and to increase the development, and then since then it's really a huge success. Uh, of course now he's the community manager, and he tries that everybody gets benefit from it. Another example is File Thunder. I know that we are a lot speaking about it, but it seems to answer a need in the Terrena community, so I'm sure uh, this will, will grow up and uh, the community will grow. 
a bonus for you. I don't know how many people of you know Arduino. Can you raise up your hand? Arduino. Ah, okay, good. Okay, so then I want, if you are fun, if your project is fun, then you get more success, chance of success, to be honest. Arduino, look on the web, you will see a lot of artistic cool stuff done. It. It's an NM system where you can plug all the modules, hardware modules, like a Lego. And then suddenly you create in few hours a really nice application, an NM system application, without much knowing about coding or even about electronics. You learn by practicing. And it's very fun. It's very fun. It answers the need. The community is positive. It's open source of the code. You can get it from the web. And it's fun. Of course, you cannot, I mean, it's quite hard uh, when we're doing network infrastructure, even myself when I'm doing research to be fun. That's life. But at least keep it that you should, uh, uh, you should answer a need. So that's it. That's the method. Finished. Yes, it is. No way. Unfortunately, when you will start your project, it's like this. You want to go to the Red Cross. Ah, I know that I can show. Yes. You want to go here to get the treasure. You will see. There is a lot of danger. You have to cross the mountains, the caves where there is some uh, very bad guys waiting for you. Oh, the pirate comes. Well, you see, it's not so easy. For me, what is really important, and for INRIA as well, we are a research public institute, values as roots. Open source values as roots. Uh, if you don't have any question at the end of this, <laughs> of this talk, don't hesitate to ask me about that. I have a very nice story. Uh, within INRIA, we did a mistake about values, and I can, teach you, I can tell you. A project is with a community. And I will even would say to you, community of a code. Yesterday, I've seen someone with a nice t-shirt must be in the room with better technology, better community. Sorry, community of a code. For me, it's important, the technology. People are more important. Community of a code. We are from the development arena. We are in RIA doing a lot of development. We take care about our developers. This evening, they are all in a meeting for two days. They are going to do parties, they are going to do projects during the night and the day. We are inviting them. We are taking care of these people, but there is a relationship with them. Project with a community. A provocation, community breeding. Unfortunately, it's a bit true. Uh, if you see my days, what uh, I'm going to show you now, uh, it's really that every morning I do the same, and I, I mean, it's really well organized. People, people, people. But what you need as well is a methodology. And it's what I'm going to try to show you. To be honest, this, there are several methodologies, so don't take this one as the truth. I'm sorry for that. It's just my ideas, OK? First of all, you should analyze. Start with a sort of analyze phase. And in fact, you start with a dream. You should dream about your project. Really, a lot of scientists lost their dream. A lot of people, engineers and developers, are losing dreams. Dream. It's really important. We lose that today. Nowadays, with this, uh, uh, you know, this world we, we are living in. Uh, in there, you are going to, to take a drink with your friends, could be, and you are going to talk about your project, your ideas, and perhaps, uh, well, thanks to this dream, you will define topics. But as well, thanks to this dream, you perhaps you will have ideas of your core team. And even some guys who would be very, who got some leadership, some leaders, Of course, you will have described your daily job, your daily project, and so you will have to define processes in, in terms of governance. Are you going to have one leader who decides of everything, or are you going to delegate with a vote like a meritocracy? The intellectual property right should not be underestimated, but it's not complicated. Licenses are not so complicated. A lot of lawyers and council are telling you it's complicated. To be honest with you, uh, they are, it's not true for me. Se I mean, the top 10 licenses, we know them. If you use them, we know how they are compatible, what are the conflicts. So for many small projects, open source projects, uh, licenses are not complicated. Of course, for Linux distribution, then it's another, it's another story, but people who are doing that are really big, big top level experts. Okay? In communication as well, you should uh, define your processes. And in terms of project life cycle, in the end, you're going to end up with your collaboration guidelines. Of course, when you start a project like this, I'm not going to ask you to fulfill a, a, a one or two pages describing your governance. 
go to Apache website. There is a very small example of, uh, of a nice uh, processes, nice politics, and so on about governance, internal property, communication. And if you go to Eclipse, you will find nice description of project lifecycle. Get them, look at them, and try just to do it simple for you. Very simple, two, three lines. You will grow it, your processes will grow as soon as you will uh, have a, a bigger community. Yeah. Community tooling. You need community tooling to collaborate all together. And I uh, noticed that uh, a lot of you spoke about uh, non-open non source project. Yesterday, as I heard SharePoint, fair enough. Uh, today, I heard Mathematica. Uh, I mean, there is Scilab from Inria, which is an ex excellent tool competing with Mathematica. Um, for SharePoint, well, for me, we use, we experiment ELG. ELG is a very nice project, open source project, where you can uh, build community, a, a community of practices very easily. Our scientific loves it because they, they are experimenting it. Huh? It's not in production for us in Inria. We, we are going to, after the test, we will see. But the, f the people who started to work with it are really happy because this tool, in very few seconds, even a secretary can create a group, a working group. And then she uh, th our secretary choose, okay, uh, I create a group, I, I give a mission statement, I give, I want a forum, I want a blog, I want a, a document repository, etc. In fact, this tool, uh, um, this tool is really simple, and I, I really advise you to, to use it. Another point is that I mentioned about uh, community tooling. Community tooling is really important in terms of collaboration. For us, it's a forge, but for your structured content, a wiki, or as well for your promotion and awareness, social net engines. Okay? So, I continue. If I have to give you two or three tricks, or at least to take away a uh, good project name, a clear mission statement, and an architecture of participation. Really important. Because like this, you will be able to let people contribute to your project, external people, manage volunteers, etc. So think during this phase about what will be your architecture of participation. Okay. Second point, build. We have to build. It's where you put bricks and mortars together and you start to code. You, you install your ELG project, etc. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain you this. <laughs> so I will just give you two or three tricks because I want to concentrate, focus on other parts. But for the building, when you are going to start coding, uh, well, I advise you to concentrate on a decentralized architecture. Think about Firefox. Firefox lets you to add plugins. The architecture, in fact, if you look at the engine, it's a sort of service-oriented architecture. It's where you can put plugin and plugin. Think about Eclipse. Eclipse is plugins of plugins. Like these contributors can easily come and contribute independently of your core engine. Documentation. I have a nice story about that. Two PHP uh, framework about security. One of them is well written. The code is perfect. No documentation. Second project, PHP project, security framework. Very nice documentation. The code is not so good. If you look at it, it's not perfectly written. There is optimization you can do. The second project with documentation well written is successful. It's really successful. The, the other one, no documentation, but the, co the code is really good. Sorry, we don't use it. Because when I arrive, I want to learn. So I, what I start with, store it the fucking manual. So documentation. Don't underestimate it. A lot of people does it. Okay, <coughs> how many people get that yesterday? Wow, that's all. I didn't do well my job. <laughs> okay, I promoted my existence. It's the same as you. You have finished your code or you have at least a package, a binary package, you can show something to people, documentation, white papers. You, you have some work done and it can be given to the others. It's time to promote your existence. It's what I did. So for that, I advise you to follow this workflow. I will try, in fact, to send broadcast messages through mailing list, from my social network platforms, but as well to uh, people who are uh, doing webzines, as well forums, bloggers, etc. And then this will reach to different communities. And these communities, maybe some people, some people may join back to you. 
So let's see how I do it. Everything I'm saying, I, I do it. Huh? <laughs> I build a list of contacts since a few years. In fact, depending on the communities we have, depending on the projects we have, we try to find on Google uh, other communities to share, if we could share interest and we could uh, help to join with them or at least to promote our existence. You know. As well, I ask my colleagues if they have any contacts or even I use my own contact networks to send messages. I participate to conferences and events and my colleagues as well. Thanks to that, I get more and more contacts. Again, another point, collaborate with Overflow's initiative is important because then you, get, you will get more emails, more contacts, and so when you are going to promote something, it's much better. Of course, this takes a lot of time. It's since several years I'm doing that, so now my contact list is huge, but it took me a long, but it's worth. Don't underestimate this. This will be part of your success. At the end, you have seen that we can use some, Google, some um, web tooling. So I use Google Search, Google Alerts, Technorati, LinkedIn Search, and many others that I keep secret. No, <laughs> you can't ask me and I will show you. <laughs> but I couldn't put the list. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, let's see an example, Google Alerts. How many of you use that? Ah, you should. <laughs> Excellent, guys. You are excellent. <laughs> what I do is, in fact, I put some keywords like Terena, open source, and then every morning I receive the list of very nice articles. For instance, here, what is the top open source licenses? What the cloud can't be separated from open source? I looked at Terena. This is a good for monitoring your community. Terena, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't got, got any Google alerts. I'm sorry, in a, in a in few hours. And I, this is so... You should monitor the Arena community with that, sorry. <laughs> OK. Um, what I do from there is I, 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 you see internetnews.com, infoworld, but I get as well another list with a lot of bloggers, a lot of webs in, very accessible for me, really. I, I, I create then, from there, my list of people who are taking care of these blogs. And then when I will have to promote or to sustain, I send news to them. You know what? They accept. And when these people need a news from me, uh, it's the reverse way. They ask me, hey, can you promote ourselves? I do it. You have seen that uh, there were two nice articles. What I do as well is that I create groups in LinkedIn. I create groups in Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. And what I use is a tool that from one tweet, it goes through LinkedIn, all my groups, all my uh, um, Twitter groups, uh, my identity.k, K, et cetera, et cetera, technology, et cetera. And in fact, what I do is either I use Twitter or I use this tool called Yono to send broadcast messages to my different communities, different groups. But as well, I could send the article, the link of the article, like these people, hey, that's a nice article, and they read it. So I keep a sort of, a sort of momentum, and the people respect the group, say, hey, it's good. I mean, he sent me a, a nice article. That's the trick. And sometimes, thanks to the Twitters, thanks to sending uh, mails to people, well, a surprise is that uh, big international magazines come, like The Wire or whatever. Without, without knowing it, these guys came uh, to our conference. We, we build and we, we promote uh, its existence. People came, we didn't know it, and they did an excellent article about us. So that's an indirect effect. So about promotion, I would really advise you to use multiple communication channels. Really. Substain. Very hard part. But let's try to, to propose some stuff. Normal, normal initiative. Hold regular conferences, do periodic events like Terena conferences, which I find really well organized, uh, lovely, nice place, nice people, nice events in the evenings <laughs> to talk with people. So really keep that, and I hope you, 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 it will long last. Uh, Another thing I always do is, um, again, thanks to Google, thanks to gra grabbing some stuff from Technorati and other places, I really try to post on my forums the news. And even sometimes Arduino does that as well. They, they have a forum and a blog. The forum, they see some interesting topics. They grab it and put it on the blog on the first page. It's excellent to do that because, again, it gives you momentum. It gives you interesting information to share with the people. Um, 
facilitate knowledge sharing. Uh, in India, we do webinars with our developers every 15 days. They can come for one hour. Uh, this program is new, so we are launching it now using Big Blue Button, an open source product that builds its uh, sort of. Uh, um, you, you are on the web, you go, you have little webcams, audio, chat, and then at the middle you have your slides presenting. It's quite nice. In 15 minutes you can, uh, you can uh, create conferences and the system. I mean, it's really easy. Uh, so big blue button and webinars are really good for knowledge sharing. Uh, facilitate user and contributor recognition. I mean, facilitate users. It's easy. What are the new members? What are they doing? A little word about them. Excellent. Contributors. What are the top contributors on your page, on your forge? It's quite easy quite good to do. I'm going to drink. Another thing as well is to, uh, to visit and participate to conferences. Really, uh, you, you, because you, you, you will be able to promote, in fact, your, your existence again, your project. So, um, I mean, you have to do that. Of course, you choose the conferences uh, you want to, to, to visit, but don't, don't hesitate as well to cross boundaries. I came here to Terena, I'm not from your community, but I came here, I crossed boundaries. Propose initiatives, so uh, to propose initiative, you, you can have very uh, initiative, very funny ones and very complex one with a lot of budget, whatever, try really to think of that, it's really important. So in INRIA, for instance, we are doing coding uh, contests, newsletters, um, what else, workshops, uh, many, many things. Use social networking again and do some periodic review because since you started, you were very small. Then you build your code, then you started to promote, then you visit conferences, people join you, you are growing. But well, it would be nice to look if there is no other communities now who as well as grow up and could be interesting to join efforts with them, you know? So don't hesitate to look around you. So this is our initiative, three of them only. Boost Your Code is a coding contest. We offer one year, uh, INRIA is offering one year uh, of, uh, of uh, contract for developer who propose a very nice project. So it's finished. Uh, we are currently evaluating the, the proposals. A lot of students, in fact, uh, uh, send us a proposal of a nice open source project. And perhaps one of them will, will get uh, one year of contract with us. And he will, developing, he will develop his idea. We are doing the FOSA conference, which is uh, the Free Open Source Software Academia conference. Uh, it's, a, it's a conference for insiders who speak to insiders. We are a bit fed up to, to hear a lot of stupid things about open source. It not the, it's not a, the war, it's not a, a, a transfer a methodology. It's much more than that. It's people. Uh, and another point as well, we are doing a, a contest within our own organization between scientific. In fact, we have to propose a nice development project, a nice research development project, and uh, we, we select the best ones and we offer them all the budget, all the everything for them to, uh, to, um, to do that uh, over two or three years. This is really good because uh, thanks to that, we can even see if two laboratories are doing the same, and so we can ask them to join together, joining meaning doing the project together, not you know, not merging, huh? we never merge, and we don't want that. So, about sustain, uh, if I have to take away something, join forces with other project. It's really important, really. Uh, I heard about exchange services, uh, the talk before, it's really that. I mean, try sometimes, if it makes sense, of course, if it makes sense. It's really a question of that. Uh, join forces with other project and pay back for the help. You will see. Um, I have many stories about that. Who, who, who doing that is really successful, but I, I don't have uh, much. I don't, I don't know what, how long I have. It's okay? Ah, it's okay, perfect. Of course, you have to recontribute to open source if you want it to work. I'm sorry, but uh, uh, INRIA is experimenting a, a tool called ELG, and uh, my friend and I are recontributing. We are, uh, when we, whenever we can, we, we try to, to contribute on the code uh, of ELG because it's, it's really needed. We use the tool for our, our intranet, but for our experimentation, of course, but we need as well to recontribute. So we are trying to create plugin, and then we publish it on the web. Another way as well, a very nice story I, I want to give you, it's I participate, uh, INRIA is participating to uh, a contest, uh, the different University of France and uh, Canada and Belgium, uh, it's really the University of France who does it, uh, they do a contest during one night. All the developers, all the students are in different places and they start uh, developing for one night on a project. And at the end of the night, 
they have to give us the results and we, we give prices. So I participate to that, so I don't sleep during one night. Uh, but it's okay, it's really funny. And then I propose a project. Many of us project propose a project. I propose a price. 12 hours non-sleep, I had just to think of a project. The, the good stuff for that is that I got, in the end, doing that, I got all the mailing list of the students. And when I told you that we were doing an initiative about boost your code, so earning one year of contract, I sent the 1,000 email saying, hey, look, we have boost your code. It's, it's for you. So thanks to this initiative, I got a list of contacts, a huge one. And I could send a broadcast message. Monitor. I'm not going to spend too much on that, but because it's nearly the end. And I want to, s to tell you, of course, you will have to, to check your web portal, meaning the number of downloads, the number of visits. Uh, of course, you will have as well to, to check the code quality with integration testing. But what you should do as well is community at large. Are you at the introduction phase, growing phase, maturity, revival, or decline? It's really important because where you put this, you know, this point, you won't be able to do a lot of stuff. I mean, when you are in introduction, you cannot do uh, things when compared to maturity. And, and when you are at maturity, you have a lot of resources to propose a lot of initiatives. So really, you have to, to look at community at large. And many people uh, misunderstand to do that, community at large. I use a dashboard for that. I'm going to show it to you. What is important, this is my dashboard. Healthy communities, I noticed since my researcher is doing that. Trust recognition is important. Listening, I heard before, listening. One of the guys here said, you have to listen to your, to your users. Yes, exactly that. But uh, an healthy community has driving purposes, clear activity, sense of accomplishment. Communication is transparent. You have a lot of actions. Neutrality is really important as well because uh, you will, by neutrality, you, you ensure the long life of your project because if you have too much industrials, perhaps uh, you will be um, captured by, by the industrials, and so you will die very quickly because your community will leave. So neutrality is important. Leadership, participation, relationship cross boundaries. Okay, but I mean, I'm speaking, speaking, but what are my successful projects? Uh, well, unfortunately, results may vary. Depends on your project, depends on the people. People are not easy sometimes to control, and we don't need that, by the way. We should motivate them. So, of course, uh, yes, results may vary. Ah, if you want. Yeah, yeah, I can. You can take a feature. So, this is from Microsoft, by the way. I don't care about IP here. So, <laughs> no, it's Microsoft who says uh, open source uh, is not always so good. So, uh, so, it's a joke for me as well. <laughs> It's a real uh, advertisement, they said, open, Microsoft said, open source is not always so good. Okay, so what we noticed during the different uh, projects we did, uh, we speed up the startup phase, really, because we knew what we wanted to do. We had a clear mission statement. We knew how to collaborate together. We know the tools we needed, and so we could quickly uh, build up an infrastructure for our community and, to f and our forge to develop. Thanks to uh, the method about promotion, we really do that. We really, step by step, we do exactly what I'm telling you. So we improve the dissemination, in fact, and the promotion of our existence. And of course, thanks to that, and there is another way. We show to industrials, or uh, not industrials, of a community, we see, they, they, they see our, our methods, and they think we are professionals. And so it increases the exploitation <laughs> plan, really. Industrial loves to see this. They are, oh yes, they look good, these guys because they have the method. But Another point we, we have seen is uh, uh, really it helps to grow the community, doing really that. And I really insisted on join efforts, join efforts, join efforts. Thanks to that, we are building alliances now. OPs, KDE, Linux Foundation. But it's not all, with as well other, st other people. I've shown you as well some keywords like uh, transparency, um, uh, relationship, um, Etc. So for us, it's really a human adventure. The method as well shows a human adventure or tries to, 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 to emphasize on the human adventure. We are human, we are people. 
And of course, all of that ensure that the life after the completion of a project continues, and I have a lot of examples where, um, thanks to the building alliances as well, uh, the project is now continuing. It's the end of the European project, but four guys, four industrial plus four universities continues to work uh, together now, without the, communi the European Commission paying. So and this is for several projects. You, you can ask me the project afterward, I can give you the list. But as well, I told you, results may vary. In my article, I really tried, I mean, it's much more explained than that. It's really, really, uh, it's, small, yeah. it's really explained uh, in, in deeper details. Uh, so I really wish you to read the article. It's 10 pages, really worth to look at it. There is a lot of tricks, a lot of uh, killer hints even. So I just put four main stuff. Some, some of our, our uh, project didn't succeed uh, really because of people commitment, uh, because we, we misunderstand, we misunderstand the creativity of the people and their leadership. Really, it's important. And as well, some research scientists underestimate the time for community management, really. Uh, of course, today this is changing, so people are understanding that they, sh they, they should increase community management time. Uh, yeah, so it's good. And of course, uh, a community does not grow or, uh, like this. Arduino did it in three years. So I, I heard, uh, I heard uh, yesterday that uh, uh, it may take time. Yeah, usually, it can take very long. As I told you, if you answer a need, blah, 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 if it's fun, look, Arduino, three years. In three years, they had a huge community, mouth-to-mouth -mouth promotion, no penny in anything. Everybody's delegating, everybody's working. But this is really an exception, I would say compared to others like W2, Scilab, um, what else, SenseLab, for instance, it takes much longer. So really, honestly, it it's takes time. Really, in, in average, uh, I can give you, we have some studies about the time. People say it's 10 years, 5 to 10 years, so, yeah. Um, so, et couch. And thank you, grazie, obrigado, tac. I don't, in Chinese, I, I'm sorry, uh, and the other language, sorry, I I, I Thank you very much, Stefan. You're welcome. Any questions? It would be easy to see if we get the lights up, up a bit, okay. Good, <laughs> no question. Any questions from the audience? Lunch. <laughs> People are waiting to run away to lunch. Um, so, so I was thinking yeah. when, when you were talking about sort of the informal infrastructure for, for communities, yeah. being on all these social networks, going to conferences, as this one, being in the part, uh, discussion of the community. But at the same time, you have your more closely knit community for your particular project. So how do you... How do you maintain the boundary between the two, and how do you maintain that you use the right time on, on your own particular project, and, and how much time you okay, devote yeah. to the community at large? Oh, so first of all, uh, you shouldn't be afraid of foreigners, or you should cross boundaries, but it's true, it has to make sense. Every time I'm sending a mail, or every time I'm uh, going to a conference, or even I'm s going to collaborate with someone just before, I take the time to say, does it make sense for us? Mm. Really? It's really important. And sometimes you say no. But uh, uh, yeah, it's like this, I, I do it. Very easy, ah, very easy. <laughs> you know. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Does not look to be the case. So thank you very much again, Stefan. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent presentation. I know you all want to run away to lunch, but before you do, um, a few announcements. Be aware that there are demos going on all day. They've been running all breaks and all the days of the conference. Go to the stands outside and watch the demos. Some of them are very excellent. Um, also know that today, this afternoon in the coffee break, the people participating in the student poster competition will be at their posters available for your comments, for questions, for discussion about their posters, to so go visit these posters and have a talk with these students who've done a lot of hard work. And look at the conference program for tonight because there's 
a long list of buffs tonight, and many of them look like I would like to be in several places at once. I need some cloning technology. Please do participate in the buffs tonight. With that, thank you very much for t participating.